We're here in the Wyma Valley in southern New South Wales, just close to the Hume Weir. And uh, this property is called uh, Rennie Lee. We, uh, we run a cattle genetics business here and uh, we run it across a number of properties. So about 3,300 hectares in total, about 3,500 head of cattle. We did a bit of an audit of the business here to understand what our total carbon hoof print is, I call it, rather than a footprint, because <laughs> it's nearly all cloven hoofed for animals. Um, so um, cattle basically have four stomachs and in the room and they have a large uh, population of microorganisms which are basically methane producing. Methanogenesis is a process. Methane has a higher global uh, warming potential than carbon dioxide. I think the figure that's now being used is about 25 times. So the cow takes in um, grass and dry matter and she, and she grazes and then at another period of the day she, she ruminates so the um, pasture inside her stomach is, is turned over and these bacteria all get to work and she basically emits methane. Firstly we wanted to understand you know, how much we are producing and then sort of the feasibility of, of how we might deal with it. For us it's about understanding firstly where we are, secondly understanding well what can we do. So we're interested in a whole raft of different approaches and I guess I'm very interested in how we adapt to climate change because we are seeing a lot of biophysical changes here on these farms. Some of the work they've been doing and improving the efficiency of their beef herd also enables them to be able to reduce their overall methane emissions profile. Things such as reducing the average age of their herd, focusing on the productivity of their heifers, and removing unproductive animals from the system, all contributes to reducing their methane outputs. So we're looking at feed efficiency on grass, for instance, is a new trait that we are hoping we'll be able to get algorithms for and that we'll actually eventually be able to select animals that are more effective on grass and producing beef with less methane. Then I guess there's all the, the other bits and pieces we do around adaptation, which is about more productive pastures. We're not very keen on using nitrogenous fertilisers. We'd much rather do it with legumes. We think that's a, probably a better way of doing the nitrogen in the system, and, and, and nitrous oxide obviously has a very high global warming index. The work that Lucina and the team have done here at Rennie Lee in, in improving pasture productivity through either pasture renovation or becoming more efficient and effective with their fertiliser use also enables them to be able to capture and store carbon in the soil. And I can see this wonderful legacy that we're going to leave um, just through this long-term strategy. We've fenced off riparian zones to, to, to make sure that the waterways are protected. We've put up shelter belts for the livestock, but, but also we've um, been very keen in the last few years, I guess, to develop uh, wider tree lines, which are really useful for, this, for the birds and for the um, and for, I guess, the diversity of, of flora and fauna in the, in the farm landscape. So we've been keen to do trees for a whole lot of different reasons. Here at Rennie Lee, the Corrigans have done some fantastic work at investing in, in some of these projects. The work they've done at putting in tree plantations and shelter belts across the property enables them to sequester carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and store that in the biomass of the trees. Many benefits in many different ways. So I guess, firstly, um, we've seen a lot of the country protected. I might add that the tree plantings we've been doing, the trees and shrubs and, and also you know, forbs and, and um, orchids and all the things that we've added into the tree lines over here at Rennie Lee, we've combined that with a perennial pasture program. So what we've been trying to do is really stabilise the landscape. We see a lot of benefits. We see a lot more small birds in the landscape. We certainly see things like echidnas. So what we're doing environmentally is really a long-term thing and, and we won't we probably won't understand all the benefits and, and all the things that we need to do, you know, this year or next year. But if we keep sort of building our knowledge, a lot of what we're doing is about building knowledge so that we can understand, okay, this is, this is what we need to do. We register these trees. We don't actually have to act on that until 2022. So we've got a little bit of time up our sleeve to, to understand what we need to do next that will be the optimum for, for the, um, the outcome we're looking for. And as I said, there are, there are many benefits and some are, you know, less easy to quantify, but they're, they're you know, they're very long term really, yeah. <laughs>